then what I'm doing isn't political. It's psychological or philosophical or theological. The political element is peripheral. And if, if people come to the live lectures, let's say, that's absolutely self-evident. That's not what they're about. That isn't why people are there. That isn't what they talk to me about afterwards. It's fundamentally irrelevant. The only reason this ever became political is because in Canada, our provincial and federal governments had the unspeakable arrogance to propose compelled speech legislation in a British common law system where that had never been done ever even once. And despite the fact that your Supreme Court in 1942 made some such things un unconstitutional. Now, and that was- Just explain to people here what, what actually happened, which is that you opposed this law, which was going to compel you, you say, to use preferred pronouns of people that are transgender. Is that accurate? Uh, it's, it's accurate, but partial. So there was, a, there was provincial laws that were already in place to compel this sort of thing, but a federal law had been generated. And I went and read the policy guidelines within which the federal law was to be interpreted. And those were produced by the Ontario Human Rights Commission, which is a radical leftist inquisition, fundamentally. And they had documented out a very large number of policies that, were, that would make anyone sensible's hair stand on end if they read them, which they didn't, but I did. And not only did I read them, I understood them. And having read them and understood them, I made videos just one night, I got up at about three in the morning because it was really bothering me for a variety of complicated reasons, including the fact that a number of my clinical clients had been bullied into states of ill mental health by radical social justice warriors at their various workplaces. And this was long before I was embroiled in any of this controversy, by the way, so it wasn't a sampling bias. And so, and at the same, and at the same time, the university, my university, had the gall, the unmitigated gall, to mandate um, unconscious bias retraining for their human resources staff, despite the fact that unconscious bias measurements are not reliable or valid, even by the testimony of their formulators, and despite the evidence that there is no, there is no data whatsoever lending unconscious bias retraining programs even the vaguest shred of credible outcome. So I made these videos, and because I was annoyed about this, and I thought, well, what will happen if I make a video? And so. Well, so this is, this is one of the things that I feel, or, or maybe you can answer it for us. I feel because of this incident, you are often characterized, at least in the mainstream press, as being transphobic. If you had a student come to you and, said, and they said to you, I was born female, I now identify as male, I, go, I want you to call me by male pronouns, mm -hmm. would you say yes to that? Well, it would depend on the student and the context and why I thought they were asking me and what I believe their demand actually characterized and all of that. Because that can be done in a way that's genuine and um, acceptable and a way that's manipulative and unacceptable. And if it was genuine and acceptable, then I'd have no problem with it. And if it was manipulative and unacceptable, then not a chance. So. Um, and you might think, well, who you, am I to judge? judge? Well, first of all, I am a clinical psychologist, and I've that. talked to people for about 25,000 hours. And so, <laughs> and I'm responsible for judging how I'm going to use my words. I judge it the same way that I judge all the interactions that I have with people, which is to the best of my ability and characterized by all the errors that I'm prone to. So, you know, I'm not saying that my judgment would be unerring, but I have to live with the consequences, so I'm willing to accept the responsibility.